Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mineral Live. I'm Jordan Orocha, with me is Antonio DiNano. And today we're gonna to be talking about one of the Rivian battery modules. So Zach from Jerry Rig Everything came out and uh, did a teardown on this, helped us get down to the cell level. So big shout out and thanks to Zach for helping us out. We're gonna put a link in this video so you can go and check out that. Um, with that being said, Antonio, uh, you helped you know, uh, get these modules out of the battery pack and we've been looking at this a little bit. What are some things that stood out to you um, when you started looking at this and, and can you kind of walk through some of the layers and some of the things that we're seeing on the table here? Yeah, no problem. Let's work our way down to uh, deconstruction. So on top of it is a protective plastic film, which uh, just keeps anyone from working on the module during installation from encountering shock hazards. You remove this, we encounter a voltage sensor harness, which is easy enough to peel and remove. And then we have a protective uh, nylon cover, or most likely nylon. We'll have to check that, but um, this just provides a uh, protective layering and allows you to get in and measure cells if you're doing measurements after all this is installed. You also have the layer of polyurethane foam, which is not a structural, it's a very light and soft foam, it's pretty squishy. So Antonio, based on how you're seeing these things come apart, is it safe to say that these, everything but that top layer is probably installed to the module, the foam is injected, and then after all of that, they're laying on that, that probably like polyethylene or that clear insulative sheet on top? Right, so if we look at the VSA strip, we don't see any material on the bottom surface. So this, the polyurethane was definitely added after this was installed. Um, and we see a uh, uncommon surface with the, uh, the sheet as it's laying on the cells. So it tells me that it rose up at an uneven rate and caused um, this to protrude in um, various ways. So this was the last thing added. Yeah, so not a really consistent fill based on the witness mark in that sheet you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And one thing to note that I noticed when we were talking about it earlier, so the foam in this, contrary to like a Tesla 4680 pack, which is that like sort of pink, very, very structural two-part polyurethane, this polyurethane in terms of the stiffness and durometer is much more akin to what you would find in a seat cushion, right? So it is... It's structural just in that it's, provide, it's taking up a lot of air gap between the cells and the various substrates. But I mean, to the touch, just with your finger, you can depress it. So it does have quite a bit of give or compliance relative to like the Model Y structural foam, which is pretty much hard as a rock to the touch. And it also provides some NVH protection on the cells and the wire bonds, which are rather fragile. Right. Um, let's move to the side plates. Uh, these side plates are the structural component that attaches the module to the pack. They are pretty substantial and of themselves. There you go. Yep. Yeah, so this is multiple layers of stamped steel along the top edge. Um, so this is the flange that attaches to the battery housing itself. So not the module housing, the structural housing that attaches to the vehicle. So we've got three different stamped layers. Those are welded together. And then in the side of this panel, we've got a lot of pierced in holes. So they'll do that in the stamping process. They're gonna stamp out those slots. They're gonna stamp out those holes. And Antonio, what, based on what you saw tearing it apart, what are those for specifically, these holes and then those slots? Uh, so the slots are a fixed ring position um, feature. There is a small little indent on the polycarbonate shell that allows the uh, steel plate to fit into that. Uh, the holes themselves are for adhesive squeeze out. So whenever the adhesive bead is applied, it gives it a spot to um, come out and provide a little bit of an extra, almost like a heat stake. Uh, right resistance yeah and you can see some of that right here on the side shield some of that adhesive start to sort of squeeze through but yeah th to me in in the sheet metal world or the gdnt world which is geometric dimensioning and tolerancing these slots are your two-way so it's a vertical alignment of this side shield relative to the two um, segments of modules that we have separated by this this cooling 
uh, plate section. So um, a, lot of, a lot of effort went into indexing this thing vertically and making sure that it's positioned relative to the Z height or the vertical position of this module um, as it's installed to the vehicle um, and as they kind of bring these various cell elements together. All right, next we'll move on to the bus bars. Um, so these are just how the electricity is transported from the cells to the next module and down to the voltage sensor harness, um, both the um, BMS system. Um, as you see, a lot of the uh, um, coating on this peeled off, so they're having a little bit of an adhesion issue to the bare metal, but that can be fixed with a plasma treat or something. So what material are those bus bars? These appear to be just a thick aluminum. We thought they might be copper. Based on what we've seen, um, there is a little bit of a yellow color in there. So, but uh, we just need to tear into these a little bit to confirm that. And then that red coating, I'm sorry, did you say that that's a coating on the bus bars? Is that like a dip or a? This is just a uh, high vol a voltage or um, insulating dip, yes. Got it, okay. Um, so these were uh, pried off from the individual points. Uh, our current collectors on the other side, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and our battery monitoring board is here. So it also has um, two... Uh, thermistors. Thermistors, yes. The words just don't work some days. Um, but these connect to different points on the opposite sides of the modules, uh, probably for a hot and cold differential. Sure. Yeah, one thing that I saw, Antonio, when, when we were looking at this earlier, I was, I was pretty pleased to see just from a um, DFM, so design for manufacturing, design for assembly perspective, um, and it also plays into what we would call like lean design principles uh, in terms of ease of build, simplicity of steps, and so forth. If you look at all these different layers, so the bus bars, this polycarbonate substrate, the BMS board and the attachment of these, which then become a little sub-assembly to the side of the battery module itself, there's no threaded fasteners used. So all of these actually use, like right here, molded in snap fit features. So this whole sub-assembly snaps into the side of the module via some counterparts also in polycarbonate on the side of the module. And even the BMS, so the, the board itself right here, snaps into features on the polycarbonate. So really, really happy to see Rivian taking advantage of that, not using a lot of fasteners. The only spot that they did use threaded fasteners was from, where was it, Antonio? Bus bar to bus bar? Right, this is a bus bar to bus, car, bus bar to bus bar connector. There is a small fastening apparatus underneath the plate, and uh, these just fit over. I like these are a little bit of a safety feature. They're a capturing uh, container, so you just press up and the screw cannot fall out or um, get lost into the high voltage electrical apparatus which you're working on. So it's a capturing fastener. Yeah, and you may ask, well, why couldn't they do a snap fit or something here? Uh, sure, you probably could have, but this is something that you absolutely want full connectivity and contact throughout the life cycle of the vehicle. You do not want any separation here so that you're not getting arcing across. So anywhere where they really want a good clamp load, positive connection from component to component, they are using a threaded fastener. So under understandably so, but where they're able to get away with just doing snap fits, like on this little sub-assembly here, um, they took advantage of it. So kudos to Rivian for doing that. On the other end of the module, we have this uh, bus bar system that is uh, connecting the top and the bottom half in series. Um, Jordan, you could probably talk more about this. Yeah, so th I think the key point here to me is that it's over molded. So the bus bar themselves, it's, it's sort of acting like a current collector in that it's reaching across um, two different bricks within the module. Um, it's it's over molded, so where you do not want metallic exposed, you don't want conduct or um, uh, electrical conductivity, they're just over molding it with a, I think this is a nylon, correct? Most likely. Yeah, uh, yeah. PA66 looks like a glass filled 25% as noted on the material here. So just that it's over molded, so it makes it easier to handle, reduces the amount of fasteners and um, intra current collector attachments and so forth. So um, relatively simple, but it makes it easy to assemble. It also was held on by these little black uh, fasteners, which I believe you call two-stage? Yeah, so this would be referred to as like a two-stage push pin. So if you look at the, the bottom of it, 
there's there's like a center a center post that comes out and if you push it in it expands those barbs so think of like a drywall anchor that you would use in your home but this is just a push pin so there are no threads here and this this is something that we've seen I, literally thousands of times on different trim applications this to me is an off-the-shelf push pin that they used in a different application that is typically used for trim. So for you Tesla owners out there, anyone who's got an EV with a frunk, pop open that hood, take a look at all the shrouds around that frunk. You'll more than likely see uh, a dozen or so of these going through little molded in holes in that panel and holding those in place. The nice thing about these are, if you pop off the top portion of this, you can pull it out, no harm, no foul, take off your panels and put it back in. So kind of interesting that they use this in a, a battery module application. All right. Before we move on to the current collector, let's talk a little bit about the structural uh, polycarbonate that's around us. Um, there is a hold in place layer on top where all the cells fit into. If you get a good side view, you can see about how far down the cell it actually goes. Yeah, and I think Antonio, you're referring to a side view like right here on the top of those cells. It's about maybe 15 to 20 millimeters of overlap where that substrate sort of gloves around the top of those cells, just like an egg carton and keeps those in position until all the side panels are snapped together and moreover, they, they shoot the foam. So what that polycarbonate is also doing is keeping all of these cell arrays and bricks in position while the current collectors are brought over the top and all of these little tabs right here, which go directly to the tops or the, the end plates on those cells um, and they get welded. So that, that polycarbonate substrate is really keeping everything in position while these pro other processes take place. Yeah. And once you get the polycarbonate layer off, these cells pop out pretty easily. Um, these are Samsung cells, so uh, they have a unique top feature where there's a more of a button top where the CID current interfit interrupter device. And these are the same 2170 form factor cells, correct? Yes, I have um, all the cells next to each other over there and we can look at that in a little bit. All right, so we're going to, can you move any metal objects out of the way? This is about 150 pounds, so we like to be careful. We don't want anything just flipping over. All right. So this is how the current collector is actually attached as, as opposed to our torn apart view. Uh, as you see, we have four cells in a brick. One, two, three, four. Um, and they go down the entire length of the module. That gives us a 72 parallel. Right, and so this is an example of like all those current collector yeah, arrays. That's one of the end ones pulled out. The, the interesting thing to me when Antonio and I were looking at this earlier was that, so the current collector itself is just a stamped aluminum component, right? So the, the primary structure here, the element that's going to carry the majority of the current is a stamped aluminum bar. Over the top of that, like are these real thin, uh, think of like aluminum foil almost. Um, that's about the, the thickness and uh, modules that these appear to have. But the interesting thing was how they were attached. When I first looked at them, and it may be very difficult to pick up on camera, that it had this strange, like I'll say, knurled surface on the top of it, which at first glance I thought, oh, well, it must be ultrasonically welded, uh, vib vibration welded, something to that effect. It certainly wasn't laser welded. But after further review, when we were peeling it back and we got some sections of it exposed where the foil was taken off, those are actually brazed in place from what we can tell. So a really interesting way to attach these little foil strips to this piece. But it does make sense in that the base material, which is the stamped aluminum, is probably 20 times thicker. And so in the world of welding, when you're welding something super thin to something super thick, relatively speaking, it becomes very difficult because what happens is before you can get both of the materials up to a molten temperature, the thin one, so this like little foil piece, would just burn right through before the base material, so the stamped aluminum, would even be ready to weld or accept a weld. I'd like to put a direct comparison from the thickness of that material to the uh, one we see on the Tesla Model 3, Model Y's that are made out of Nevada. Uh, this is a much thinner section of aluminum. 
I'm not sure why they went with that thickness, but it might be a structural component, it might be a machining issue, because uh, there's a laser weld process on the actual bonds, whereas Tesla's using wire bonding of ultrasonics, so it's less um, force applied. Right. Yeah, the only thing that uh, I was sort of thinking out about when I looked at this is maybe dimensional stability. If these current collectors are laid on top of that module in a specific array, as they go to fixture it in order to laser weld it, you want dimensional stability. So when I push down in the center, you don't want the ends to just fold up like a potato chip. You want this thing to be structurally uh, sound and stable so that you make, again, we were talking about good contact with the bus bars. Same principle applies here. You want everything to be in good contact, um, good conductivity between the two metallic uh, segments. And so it may be just that they increase the thickness to hold these in position for us for an additional process, which in this case is the laser welding to the cells. The actual bonds themselves, uh, there is a negative, which has a two location weld on a single piece, which is a nice touch from an engineering perspective. And you have the positive terminal, which has a fusible thin section, a little bit easier to see on this side, uh, which is a single laser weld to the top of the can. So Antonio, maybe let's talk a little bit about maybe the build process. So the bill of process, and then with that, we can also touch on the thermal management aspect. So um, when I look at this, what's on the table here, I see three primary elements. So I see two halves of the module, upper and lower, and those are joined together in the center by a thermal management or a uh, cold plate. So they're running, um, similar to other applications we've seen, they're running ethylene glycol through a brazed aluminum stamped uh, enclosure which provides cooling circuits so that they get uh, coolant or thermal exchange to the tops of one segment of cells and the bottom of the other segment of cells. So Antonio, when you look at that, wh what do you think the bill of process looks like? How do you think these are built up and then joined together? Um, just for consistency of build, I would assume these are assembled upside down where the cells are placed into this top holder with maybe a thin layer of adhesive to keep them from moving around. Um, and then the side plates are attached uh, to give you some stability when moving the material, or the um, half of a module around a production line. Um, once everything is secured in place of these structural adhesives, they're not gonna move too much and they can be attached to the cold plate in a pretty easily manner. Um, the cold plate itself is also has a bit of a paint coating as opposed to uh, the uh, polyester powder coat we saw elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a unique feature for Rivian. Uh, the urethane foam it does provide some intercell connection, but it doesn't really, it's not strong enough to be a so, um, structural component. Right. Yeah, Antonio, maybe if you spin this so that we can see the ends of the coolant plate, we can explain a little bit more about how these two yeah, no come problem. together. Yeah, so it looks like, Antonio, if I'm hearing you correctly, this, this is one side, right? So this, this rectangle is one side of this sub-assembly. Yeah, they would there's probably... A, there's a center cooling yes. plate, and then there's a oppositely symmetrical version of that, or, or I'll just say... Uh, upside down version of that on the opposing side. Is that accurate? Right. So if I, if I was picturing this going down the assembly, you would have one upside down. Uh, you'd place the cooling plate onto it, let yep. that cure, and then add the other layer. Yep. So some telltales for us in terms of how this is built up is that um, we're seeing some of the foam right here some of the, the PUR foam, polyurethane foam, leak out on top of the cooling plate. So it suggests that before it was foamed, they were together. Um, however, we are seeing this little Q, QRC or QR code label on the outside of the cooling fin, which is actually covered up by this BMS slash bus bar assembly. And so for traceability, that tells you that if they can't scan that, it probably means that this cooling plate is separately tracked, not built up with the module. So they're building up these two halves of the module, bringing them together, and this becomes the center of the sandwich in terms of build process, not just architecture. Um, I think we can wrap up with comparing the cell to other types of cells we've seen. 
we have the 18650 or 1865 from the Plaid. We have the 2170 from the Model 3, Model Y. This is the Rivian battery we just put out, the 4680. We have a prismatic and a pouch cell. So just a size comparison to the different types of cells you can see in your vehicles. Yeah, and I think one of the key differences to mention on both the pouch and the prismatic cells, so these larger rectangular cells in the back, is typically those are, those are packaged inside of other, I'll say, metallic boxes inside of the overall battery housing. So you get a much more, I'll call it Russian doll effect, where you've got a box inside of a box inside of another box versus the cylindrical cells. They tend to be encased in something much more like this, potted with foam. Um, in some cases like Tesla, they're even weaving cooling fins uh, within them, whereas the pouch and prismatic, typically you just have one thermal management or cold plate running along the base of all of them. So very, very different executions when you go from any sort of cylindrical cell to a more rectangular pouch or prismatic type of cell. Right, so when people talk about the uh, power density, uh, these guys, the prismatics and the pouches, are much more dense on an individual cell level, but because of all the extra stuff, these uh, separator films, the boxes that go inside the boxes that go inside the boxes, they actually become less efficient as the pack is fully assembled compared to the cylindricals. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Antonio, for walking us through uh, how this thing is built up. Again, thanks to Je Zach from Cherry Rig Everything for helping us get these things apart. Um, again, go and check out that video. I want to make mention that Monroe is still hiring, so definitely check out a little video we have for you on that. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time. Well, Corey, you certainly have had a lot of jobs. I'm a bit of a spark plug and uh, human resources lady. Oh, you know, it's actually, it's Pam. Oh, well, Pam. No, my name is Pam. Are you saying Pam or Pam? I'm saying Pam. Yeah, I'm sorry, who is this gentleman sitting behind you? Hello, Miss Lady. I'm Sandy. I'm Corey's stepbrother. And I think I can sort out this Pam, Pam problem. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Pam. 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 Pan. It's P. A. N. N. M. P. A. N. N. Two N's. Pam. P. A. M. Two M's. That's the confusion. Hmm. No, there's just one M. Okay, I think we've had enough here. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth for one second. I'm sorry, what did you say? You're just coming off stupid. I'm coming across as stupid and you're wearing tuxedos to a job interview that requires cleaning the bathrooms? Get out of my office. We're done with this interview. Do we at least get any souvenirs? Get out of my office. Hello, Miss Lady. I'm Corey's stepbrother. Shit. <laughs> I'm Corey. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. I'm not Corey. Please leave my office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds tough. Man alive, you sure you're in HR? I'm coming off as stupid and you're wearing tux. <laughs> I'm Corey. I'm, why do I keep saying that? <laughs> I sure hope you got all this. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was never meant for this. We should get a professional. Get out of my office. No souvenirs. Oh, no souvenirs. Hmm. Well, screw it. <laughs>